give us your brief introduction. Okay, my name is uh, Hani Al Banna. I'm a medical. I was a medical doctor qualified from Al Azhar University in 1976. I came to UK 1977 to do my medical degree and we started uh, relief work in 1984 uh, where the famine in East Africa in, in Eritrea and Tigray started at that time when we created Islamic Relief. So I wanted to find out from you what really prompted you to establish Islamic Relief because we understand that you are one of the founders of Islamic Relief worldwide and uh, this organization was established in 1985. What really prompted you to establish, to be part of uh, the establishment of uh, Islamic Relief? Uh, in 1983, there was a big famine in Eritrea and Tigray in Ethiopia at that time. And we found that there's no Muslim organization in the country responding. Most of the mosques were raising funds and giving it to other organizations. And they felt a duty on our shoulder that we have to do something as Muslims and start to establish an organization, to use the organization as a vehicle to help people outside UK. That's why, because there was no organization responding to the famine, we started to think about creating an organization to respond to a famine or any other disaster. So, how does the organization now operate? It is an international organization. It has more than 40 offices in different countries. It has a very good relationship with the British government, with other European governments, with the community, such as UN agencies, World Food Program, UNSCR, uh, World Health Organization, uh, UN OCHA, uh, and, and other uh, organizations. It has a partnership with ECHO, which is a part of European Union, and it has a lot of partnership with a lot of organizations, international agencies in different parts of the world as well. So you have uh, these countries? 75 to 80% of the fund coming from the local community. Local, and, local community meaning what? Uh, with people like yourself in America, in Canada, in UK, in Switzerland, in Sweden, in Germany, in France, in all these countries. So we raised from the public, the fund, about 20 to 30 percent of the budget comes from governments and UN agencies. Okay, how do you raise the funds from the public? It is through radio appeal like this, through a TV appeal, through mail shot, through online donation, through, through organizing events such as charity dinners or sports activity or other uh, events that have been organized by the volunteers or Islamic Relief itself. Um, is your organization working independently because uh, we have seen other charitable organizations uh, collaborating with other organizations as well? Yeah, yeah. Is Islamic Relief working independently? Well, it has both. Yani Sometimes it works with the local community, so the children, the local organization in Sudan and Niger, Mali and Chad, <coughs> and sometimes they work independently, and sometimes they collaborate with international agencies in different countries to work on their behalf in certain areas if they are not working there. So it's, it's not one size fits all. It, it depends on the locality, it depends on the security level, it depends on the remoteness of the problems and the uh, fund, the, the justified fund to open an office or not to open an office. Okay, fine. Um, the way you have said that, uh, you said that uh, they, this organization was established in 1985. 84. 84, fine. It's now more than three decades yes. since it has been operational. Yes. How could you describe its impact towards humanity? It helps more than 117 million people over the last 35 years is number one. Uh, it amongst the orphans who have been sponsored 
by Islamic myth, many of them are qualified from universities in a good position in their own countries. In a country like uh, Niger, and Niger was started 10 years ago by making a small community farm. Now it's like a forest. With actually all this small community farm organized by women in the area. And this is another impact on the climate and on actually on the uh, local community. Now it's having something new called the uh, uh, humanitarian, uh, humanitarian, had, uh, humanitarian and uh, development academy, humanitarian academy for development, which talk about training, capacity building of the Islamic leaf staff as well as other organization as well. Uh, this is another impact from a different dimension. Inside the organization, they have got partnership and membership with other faith organization, such, uh, la, 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 such as World Vision, such as Christian Aid, such as uh, Tier Fund, the Catholic Aid for Civil uh, Overseas Development. It is represented on high level meeting, whether in Rome or New York or in the Middle East or in Berlin, other countries. So it, it has a lot of, uh, it has a new advocacy department which talk about uh, the rights of poor people, the rights of displaced people, the rights of refugees and so on. So it has uh, a research department among us. Uh, humanitarian academy for leadership for the, for development uh, it has a policy uh, which is structured to help governments to in consulting with the government to help the local community as well so all these sort of things is happening uh, it's empowering people it has companies which uh, do the microfinance in Bosnia, in Kosovo, in Pakistan. Uh, it also has these uh, livelihood projects, which is a uh, supply animals uh, to local farmers, as well as empower the local farmers to enable them to create uh, income for themselves. Yeah, you have explained about the level of activities that the Islamic Relief Worldwide is uh, undertaking. Uh, s somebody may uh, argue or maybe make an, interf uh, and an inference uh, that uh, by the way the Islamic Relief may be thinking that uh, the Islamic Relief only, underlining the word relief, only is involved in um, short-term measures. For instance, uh, you mentioned the issue to do with the female which prompted the establishment of uh, the organization and uh, just a couple of months ago we saw some relief uh, here in Malawi you know responding to the, uh, to the disaster uh, yeah. the disaster uh, which affected uh, Malawi and the other countries like mm -hmm. Mozambique and we also we also how the summit relief responded to Myanmar uh, issue so maybe somebody may be thinking that maybe some relief is there maybe to respond to issues for short-term measures. No, we started like this in 1984, but we developed the idea into rehabilitation and development. That's why the issue of long-term projects in African countries and in Pakistan, like when I visited Balochistan last year, there was some project called community farming. There's some project called, called actually, uh, sand dams, which will build uh, dams in the area to retain water for agriculture. This is not a short-term project, it's a long-term project. Uh, the livelihood project is not a short-term project, but actually it's a long-term project because actually it goes from generation to generation. And all these kind of things actually came after the disaster uh, uh, end. Because what you look at at the time of disaster, this 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 my appeal now. No, nothing to do with Islamic belief. No, it's to do with your donors. At the time of disasters, our donors and your donors getting excited 
to give money for relief only. And when the media leave actually the field of disaster or the field of military conflict and peace come, you find that your donor who gave a lot of money, millions and millions and millions, to disaster stricken area will never give any penny for development, for rehabilitation, for capacity building, for advocacy and for other things. And this is something very serious to talk to the donors, to tell them you have to divide the cake between emergency response and between uh, building the community. In my own view, which I keep fighting for it as long as I live, inshallah, I need to take some part of the relief budget to spend it at the time of this disaster on different issues inside the community, like community building, like organizational building, like capacity building, like building the municipality, look at municipality in the affected area. Like if you look at an, an area like Tsunami, Tsunami in 2005, to, no, 1995, sorry. Tsunami, 90, uh, 2005. 2005, sorry, my mistake was, uh, was the dates. And, and it, it happened in uh, 2004, it happened 2004, December, uh, Christmas, 2005. When the water uh, when it subsides or what? Subsidies. We find no civil servant, no record. Why? A part of the relief expenses, we have to build this municipality again, because there was no record and there was no even employee to have the uh, history and the memory and the know-how. So with the traditional donor, we have to tell them, we need to take some money, some part of the humanitarian response to build the local community, which will be able to be sustaining its activity and be sustainable uh, community, inshallah. Oh, finally, why do you think uh, there is a need uh, for organization like you, uh, like yours, uh, some relief, that uh, this organization should also concentrate on uh, issues to do with the capacity building, like uh, maybe also involved in um, providing assistance towards uh, uh, poor people yeah. getting or attaining a yeah. higher level of education. Uh, any country have, has to have three sectors to build it and sustain its operation. The government sector as a huge sector which make the policy of the country. The private sector which invest in the government and the country on the, na and the, on the national level. And the uh, NGO sector. To be very honest, NGO sector sometimes become more powerful than some governments, and then some of the private sector in certain countries. That's why you have to complement, the three have to complement one another. You see, if I, if I look at a country like Malawi, you might find one of the INGO, International Non-Government Organization, which is headquartered in America, or headquartered in uh, UK, might find actually its budget equivalent to the budget of the Malawi uh, government. So here what we want to, the government here, to encourage, to encourage the local community to build a stronger civil society organization, to enable such civil society organization and civil society sector to protect the country from such organization who might come here to change the culture, to change the religion, to change the philosophy of thinking, and to be standing next to the local government and next to the uh, business community in the country. So this is very important because nowadays, in my own view, my own view, I say, if you have a, a, a country which is very rich, a good maybe 70 or 80 million, very strategic geographical location, does not have a strong civil side sector, I call, I say, this is my quote, you can quote me, this is the fragile state. What do you mean fragile state? Because the foundation of the state is 
full of some hollows, gaps. Who fills these gaps are the local civil society organization. If we don't have the local civil society organization organized to help the government and the private sectors, they will be standing on a shaky ground. Because the local organization reaches the disaster stricken area faster more than the government and the business. Because it's from the local villages we start, from the local church we start, from the local mosque we start, from the local temple we start, till the government comes after a day or two or three or five days or so and so. So really these three sectors has to be empowered actually to help stabilizing and building the societies inside the country. You hear a mission that uh, uh, sometimes you know, donors or those people that maybe help you or help you organization or organizations become reluctant when it, when it comes to issues to do with um, uh, capacity building. Uh, why is it like that? Because we, saw, we, we, we normally see those, uh, the, the same people uh, responding quickly yeah. towards uh, issues to do with uh, disasters. Yeah, this is a traditional mindset. Mm. I believe in sack of flour. I don't believe in capacity building program because it does not feed. They do not see that the capacity building program feed or provide provide food or provide water or provide medicine or provide shelter. So, oh, and this is really not only with the Muslims, it is cross board. People do not less to development, less and less to capacity building and training and, and, and less and less and less to research less and less and less and less to building think tanks. Uh, even so for this we have to look at why we are actually left behind or not at the front of the humanitarian sector, global humanitarian sector because we do not invest in capacity building research, in development, in advocacy in all doing, on media, you see, sometimes our ulama say don't go to media, wrong. Those ulama are not living in this world at the moment. Don't talk to media, wrong. Don't speak about the organization to the media, wrong. This is not ulama. Maybe, maybe some may argue that uh, we don't want to publicize our, it's not act your, our activities. No, 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 no. i tell you something. If it's your own money, do whatever you want with it. But if it's public money, you have to show the public that you have raised this fund and spent this fund in this area, either by uh, by video or by audio or by printed material. Okay, and this is this is becomes nowadays. Can that can that uh, can that not uh, nullify your near intention of doing that? Your near is for yourself. I can do the same without making any publicity and they can steal the money from the organization. Because my need is for myself. But the duty of myself to the community is to show them, to show them and to encourage others, to encourage others to donate because they see you going to this area. If they don't see you, they don't believe you. Sp especially for the land. The other non-Muslims and other organizations are very good at this. And when they see you doing all this great work, and nobody knows about it, you will never encourage the youth or motivate the youth because they don't know what you are doing. Okay, fine. We understand that uh, Sami Relief uh, is, uh, has an, uh, uh, its office in Malawi. Yeah. Uh, for how long has it been operational and uh, what has been the impact in the country? I don't, there, there's an office here you can interview the director. <laughs> We met her yesterday in Zumba distributing some aid material for the cyclone affected uh, people. And I think it's maybe about, about at least 10 years in the country. They have got orphan sponsorship program. They have got, uh, uh, I, I, I cannot talk too much because I have, I was not prepared to talk about the office here in, uh, in this country. But you're most welcome to ask uh, the country director to come and have an interview with you. All right, so as Isami Relief, what are you doing in terms of uh, maybe 
uh, making a lot of people to understand uh, the need uh, of uh, capacity building. What are you doing in terms of maybe raising awareness? Among I think this is why Islamic Relief has started humanitarian uh, academy for development uh, five years ago to try to specialize in capacity building program independently from Islamic Relief because it has its own staff who are making the program who are partnering with other universities and other institutions to give certificate to the successful people who will be trained by the academy. This is what they have started five years ago. Okay, fine. I understand that um, you have a lot of activity that you are going to carry all you are in this country of Malawi. Um, one of the activities in speaking to most youth at uh, one of the universities yeah. uh, in Malawi, here in Malawi, what actually has prompted you to visit Malawi? Uh, you will be asking us, okay? Why I came to Malawi? First of all, the cyclone to see the in the area. It's number one. Number two, to talk to the local community, the local youth organizations. Number three, to uh, learn from the local experience. Like since I came two days ago, I've been learning a lot about the mechanics of the civil society. Uh, atmosphere and work in this country uh, so I'm learning a lot which is very important for me number four to share my experience with the experience of others number five is to look forward for a solution to some of the problem which we faced in UK or globally so instead of them starting from scratch okay they started from we ended so for these five reasons actually I came to Malawi Okay, fine. What, so far, how, uh, what information have you gathered uh, in regard to the disaster? I think the, the water is, is, is uh, going down nowadays, and we need a lot of work to be done on, on uh, building houses, on providing sustainable income for the people who lost their livelihood uh, uh, income as well. And uh, so I'm not sure how much uh, we lost uh, from the, uh, the livestock that the farmers are having or the crops that the farmers were planting. All these sort of things actually is needed, actually. And organizations like most of the local organizations, even other organizations like MDAT from South Africa, which I came with them uh, to Malawi, is providing uh, assistance, whether food assistance or other assistance, to the, the affected local community. Yeah, you also said that you will speak to some Muslim youth. I will. Oh, you will. Fine. Inshallah. Yeah, so what message you want to deliver? I want to understand what are they doing. So to tell them the message, because uh, they might be doing a lot of activities. And for my ignorance, I give them a, a message which they don't need. So I listen until I understand from them uh, what is their main aims and objectives. I will deliver my message. But my, my general message for the young people, you are going to be the leaders of the future. So be the second in command during the present time. You will never be able to become a future leader unless you become the second in command actually at the, at, the, at the moment. Why? Because you have to be shadowing the current leader. And I, my, my message to the current leader is if you don't use, if you don't have youth and women in organization, you have a dead meat organization. Organization will never grow. It will just going around itself like merry go round. All right, what would be your message to Muslims in the country? Muslims in the country has to be a part of the global, a part, not a part of the national citizenship of the country. They should not live in ghettos. They should not isolate themselves from other bigger community or other communities, which is the other uh, non-Muslim community. 
They should not divide themselves according to the schools of thought because this could be in my social opinion, my social opinion, my social opinion, haram, and makro. They should not actually uh, divide themselves as of, of their ethnicity. I am an Indian, I am Pakistani, I am whatever it is, no. We are, we are equal in all these sort of things. They should not isolate themselves internally from one another. They should build bridges internally and build them between themselves in different Muslim community, as well as extending these bridges to the outside community. Well, maybe 